Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Big Night Migration, Part 2, Behind the Camera. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Charlie Reinertsen. Hey, Charlie, thanks so much for being here today. We are ready for part two. Let's go ahead. Thank you, Sonny, and welcome everyone on this uh, Thursday afternoon. I'm calling in from Saranac Lake, New York, which is in the heart of Adirondack Park. Uh, and in this area, we're coming up on a really incredible phenomena where all of the amphibians are thawing out from having been frozen for the entire winter and they are about to make their way to their uh, uh, vernal pools and areas where they breed. And this is a really important time in their life cycle and a time where we can also help them ensure that they make that big migration and are able to cross roads wherever they encounter them uh, to be able to help support these critters. And today's chat, just to give an overview, I did do a part one on the big night uh, last week, and you can find that in the archives with Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Uh, but uh, today we'll do a brief overview of the big night, and then we're really going to focus on um, photography tips and ways to uh, help document this incredible event that happens every spring. Uh, right here, this is an aerial image of a waterway where one of these migrations does occur. And as you can see, that road, like a lot of roads everywhere, are crossing habitat uh, that prevents animals from being able to get from one area to another. And if you think about amphibians, it's a big challenge for them to get from their upland forest habitat that they've been spending the winter in down into these wetland areas without having to cross a road. So we'll talk about different ways that we can help make sure that they can get across the road and uh, also ways that we can help spread the word and, and support the big night migration. Just a little bit about me. I've been working in the field of science communications for the last decade, uh, most recently working on the climate solutions exhibit at the Wild Center, uh, which is located over in Tupper Lake, and that's the image on the bottom here. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to start my own business, Two Line Studio, and I support various different groups with their communications and marketing efforts. And uh, through that, I've also had flexibility to get back into guiding, which is one of my favorite things to do, being able to connect people directly to the world around us and get to explore some of these incredible uh, wildlife encounters that you can have. Uh, right now, I guide in Yellowstone National Park, Grand Teton National Park, in the Michoacan uh, Monarch Butterfly, uh, migration in Mexico, um, as well as the canyons trip in the Southwest. And all of those are really incredible opportunities to get to know some amazing wildlife and ecosystems. Uh, but today we're going to focus on something that you don't often get to experience or never get to experience on a natural habitat adventure uh, tour, uh, which is the big night. And these next few slides, if you tuned in last week, they'll be a little bit familiar, but I'm just gonna move through them a little bit more quickly. Uh, so tonight we're talking about frogs, newts, and salamanders. And in particular, we're talking about the Northern forest. So that encompasses the Great Lakes and then the Eastern seaboard. Uh, migrations like this happen throughout North America in different regions, but uh, the critters that we're going to meet today and talk about um, are going to be from where I'm calling in from, which is Adirondack Park. Uh, just a little bit of background on amphibians. They're cold-blooded, so they're getting their, uh, they're managing their body temperature through the environment. So they're moving into warmer or cooler areas to try and maintain a very consistent body temperature. They often have both in a juvenile and an adult phase. And often that is separated by being an amphibious phase and a terrestrial phase. Many amphibians breathe through their skin, which makes them a really important organism to pay attention to for conservation purposes. Because if we have pollutants or chemicals that are entering an ecosystem, 
the first to be susceptible to that or experience some of the harmful impacts of that are the amphibians. And that's because they have uh, such a permeable layer. They have, they have such an interchange with uh, the environment through their skin. Uh, so if you are able to document the presence of certain amphibians uh, in an ecosystem, it's an indicator that that ecosystem is fairly healthy. Uh, another thing to note that we don't often think about is that some of these species can live for decades. You know, when you encounter a toad, are you really thinking about that they might have uh, lived for multiple years or a salamander that's lived for 20 years? These animals also have this incredible adaptation to be able to freeze over the winter. So think about that. These animals, they are literally stopping their heartbeat. They no longer breathe and they're able to reanimate as soon as they thaw. Uh, in, in some instances, they can be hopping within minutes of thawing out. Uh, and obviously this is a huge risk to them when you think about ice formation, ice crystals can pierce cells and cause cell death. And one of the ways that they get around that is essentially super cooling their organs. So they focus on the most vital cells within their bodies and they um, increase the sugar levels, the glucose in those areas. It's the same as an adding antifreeze into your car. It depresses the freezing point and allows those organs to remain ice free and they shunt the water uh, into the area around their cells or outside of their really important cells. Uh, and those areas can incur some damage without killing the organism. So, it's just an amazing thing that has been happening for the last few months is all of our amphibians and, and a lot of our reptiles in this area um, have simply been buried underwater in the mud under leaf litter frozen and now they're going to reanimate and they're going to move through one of their most important life cycles uh, which is uh, to go on their spring migration. Uh, to be able to mate in different vernal pools. So they're seeking out small bodies of water without predators because predators like brook trout and other fish uh, are going to just decimate any eggs that they lay. So they're trying to find these vernal pools where other predators such as damselfly are not present. And often they're looking for ephemeral ponds, which are only available for a short time there are a lot fewer predators and it gives them time to be able to metamorphose through their juvenile stage. Often that means they're a tadpole living in the water for a certain amount of time, feeding on algae and other macroinvertebrates. And then eventually they metamorphose into their adult phase and then move into land or a wetland ecosystem. Uh, so this is an incredibly important time and all of these amphibians are congregating. They're trying to meet together in these safe havens of water uh, to be able to mate and lay all the eggs and be able to develop into their adult phase. Now, this happens in a very particular set of circumstances. These animals are triggered to migrate when it's warm, rainy, and the ground and the waterways are thawed that equals the conditions that we need to be able to have a big night. Big night migrations are most active from sunset for the next two hours. So, uh, you know, this time of year in this region, you'd be looking at like 8 p.m. until 9 or 10 p.m. Um, is the activity, high activity level on really saturated wet nights. Right here, we're taking a look at a spotted salamander that's crossing the road. And it's one of the very distinctive salamanders that gets a lot of attention because it's really big. I mean, this is a seven, eight inch uh, long animal. So those are the conditions. Today, we're really talking about that big night migration to be able to get out into these vernal pools. Uh, and these animals have been living in woodland habitats and they're making their way down, congregating in small bodies of water and laying their eggs. So the next phase, before we talk about photographing these animals, I wanted to introduce you to a few of the characters that you might find if you were to go out on a big night uh, in the Adirondacks or the you know, New York State and even in the Eastern Seaboard, these animals will all exist in those areas. So first, let's get to know the spotted salamander. 
and here you can see these are just charismatic little fellows. Uh, you know, one of the big things that's really fun about this migration is that if you're aware of it, if you're tracking it, if you get hooked up with groups who are helping to volunteer to help these guys cross the road, um, it's an opportunity to meet species that you would ordinarily be really rarely encountering. You know, when I'm out in the woods and in their habitats during the summer and during the fall, I'm constantly turning over logs and I know where to look, but I still don't find these salamanders. And I don't find them in the numbers that happen on the big night migration. And I don't find the diversity of species. Up here, you can see seven species of salamander in one night on the big night migration. And it's just this magical thing where you're out with a headlamp, you're just walking the road where you know a big night might happen or where the migration typically occurs. Um, and you're looking for these shiny worm-like creatures crawling across the road. Uh, so let's get to know the spotted salamander. They can be six to 10 inches long, and these are nocturnal animals. Uh, they lay eggs in the water, and the juveniles have gills that allow them to breathe underwater. Uh, those gills kind of look like these frilly extensions at their, at their neck. Um, and they, as adults, they have these toxin glands that help deter predators. That's pretty common across all amphibians that they have some level of toxicity on their skin. And they have a huge range. You can actually find these all the way from California or uh, Canada to Texas, not California. I put the wrong abbreviation there. Uh, and they also eat insects, tadpoles, smaller salamanders, and they're a really important food source for other animals in this ecosystem, including skunks, raccoons, turtles, and snakes. These guys have an incredibly long lifespan. They can live for 20 to 30 years, and we know that in part because of studies that document the specific uh, spot pattern on their backs. So if you take a picture of a salamander, that pattern, even as it grows, is going to remain the same, and it's like a fingerprint. You can ID these individuals based on that. So if we have really good photographic evidence of these animals, uh, we can see them year after year and track their presence in an ecosystem. And they, we also know that for most salamanders and amphibians, frogs, um, they are returning to the very same vernal pool year after year after year because uh, it's, it's been proven to be a successful spawning breeding habitat. Uh, so they, they return to the same place. And there are more than 1 million of these in North America. While this isn't a species of major concern, uh, we are still monitoring it because amphibians, again, are so susceptible to habitat degradation, whether that's from pollution or from uh, being separated from their habitat. If you think about it, these crit critters are only traveling about a half mile from their uh, summer uh, and wintering grounds down into these vernal pools uh, to mate. Um, but if there's a road placed right in the middle of that, that creates a barrier and a high rate of mortality. If you looked at a graph for these creatures that, that showed a, a graph over time showing mortality of, of their lifespan, most mortality in the wild it happens in the, in the juvenile and in the egg stage. So once they lay their eggs, they tend to have hundreds of eggs, lots and lots of eggs. Um, and the predation at that point in time in their lives causes many of those eggs not to make it to the next stage. Um, but from there, as adults, because they have some of that toxicity, they're not very heavily predated. Uh, so they have a pretty good life, with the exception of habitat degradation, pollution, and also you know, roadways, road mortality. Uh, so that's those are the big risks. The other thing that spotted salamanders do, uh, they, they have a most amphibians have some type of courtship ritual, especially salamanders. Uh, and in this case, the males will kind of wiggle their tail and they'll release pheromones that kind of uh, 
and indicate to the female whether or not she wants to breed. Uh, and then it's kind of this elaborate courtship display, but it's something that's not witnessed very often because how many people like me are so obsessed with amphibians that they're out there trying to document this. Uh, so the next species that I want to introduce you to is the wood frog. And I wanted to introduce you to this one because they're very common. You can find them in a lot of places. And uh, they also are often the first to arrive in the spring. They're the quickest out of the gates. Once they thaw, they're headed to those vernal pools. Now, these are usually about one to three inches. They have a three-year lifespan and they freeze over the winter, just like the other amphibians we were talking about. And like I said, they're the first to emerge once that snow thaws and you can even see them moving across snow. Uh, there are some videos of amphibians uh, doing that, which as ectotherms where they're getting their heat from their environment, that is just amazing. Uh, females lay between one and 3,000 eggs in every go. Uh, so that's, that's a huge kind of a shotgun approach. They're trying to get as many young out there because not very many of those are going to survive all the way to adulthood. Now, they're the only frog to live north of the Arctic Circle. So you actually can find wood frogs in Alaska. They have an incredible cold tolerance. And the adults eat insects, worms, slugs, and snails, and the tadpoles happen to eat algae. One of the neatest pieces of research that's happening with these particular frogs, you know, a lot of what I try to do when I talk about amphibians is to kind of break down our concept of what they are. You know, a lot of people think of them as slimy, you know, not attractive, and uh, you know, just not very sentient beings. And what's interesting is that wood frogs have been shown to have the ability to recognize family members. We don't know exactly how, it's probably through pheromones, uh, which are chemicals released that allow animals to communicate with one another. Um, and wood frog tadpoles have been shown to group together by family. So if they're more related to another tadpole, they will huddle together. And one of the theories behind why this adaptation would come about is that different tadpoles and different frogs will eat other tadpoles. And so if you stay with your family, hopefully you'll have protection in greater numbers. So that's the wood frog. Another piece about this is that they're the first to thaw and they're the first to start calling. So if you're walking through the woods in um, the northern forest, whether you're in the Great Lakes or the eastern seaboard uh, north of, you know, Massachusetts, Connecticut, you have a chance to be able to hear uh, the chortle of the wood frog. So they're, they're the ones out there kind of snickering in the woods. We're like, <laughs> terrible impersonation. But look it up. You can search wood frog call. And I guarantee you, if you spend time in the spring, you'll recognize that call. And if you're moving through a trail that eventually gets to a pond, uh, you'll hear it really loud. And then as you approach, they'll get quiet uh, because they're you know, anticipating that there's a predator in their ecosystem. But their call is, is described as this chortle and it's definitely worth checking out. The next one, and all of these are pictures that I've taken, and I was so proud to be able to get this picture. This is one that I took a couple years ago uh, during one of the big night migrations here in the Adirondacks. It's the four-toed salamander. This salamander is incredibly unique. It has a lot of amazing um, you know, details about it. They're, in, they're the smallest amphibian, so they can be as small as two inches. So this guy here was only a little bit over two inches long and I was using a pretty long lens to be able to make it appear much larger than that obviously um, and their distinct marking that tells you that it is a four-toed salamander is that they have a white belly with black spots they are the only salamander that has four toes on all four appendages uh, often salamanders will have four toes in the front and five toes in the back but this one has four everywhere so that's another uh, way to identify this particular salamander. And this salamander is unique in that they actually mate in the fall. And the only uh, sex that is migrating in the spring are females. 
and they are migrating to be able to lay their eggs. And they've been documented migrating as far as a mile. For an animal that's two inches long to migrate a mile, I haven't done the math on it, but I'd love to compare like how that stacks up against you know, based on a size comparison to really big animals and when they travel hundreds of miles. Uh, they are, this is where I'm starting to talk about like amphibians defy our expectations or kind of the story that we've built around them. Mothers will actually guard their eggs for six to eight weeks until they hatch and become the juveniles. And often uh, mothers will uh, lay their eggs together and there's been uh, you know some investigation around this to figure out why would they do this why would they do communal nesting because in theory if a predator finds that and they're able to uh, get the mothers away from their eggs um, that would be you know a really great food resource and you would potentially lose out on all of those young um, but what they found is there's an antifungal bacteria that is more prevalent when they lay eggs as a group. And so the idea is that salamanders that chose to lay eggs in a group were actually more likely to have that antifungal bacteria, which is a beneficial bacteria that helps to ensure that the eggs make it to the next stage of life. And so that kind of encouraged them to, you know, individuals who are predisposed to do that would then have a, a benefit and then pass on that disposition to their progeny. Uh, these are also another salamander that has the ability to regenerate. So there's a pinch at their um, uh, the beginning of their tail. It constricts a little bit. And I've had I've read a couple different sources on this that say contradictory information. On one hand, uh, people say that, um, and this is these are scientists who are observing it in the field, um, are observing that uh, these salamanders can lose their tail, a predator can grab onto the tail, the tail breaks off at that point, and the salamander is able to escape while the predator thinks that it has the whole salamander. Now, uh, the, the, that's obviously pretty intensive for them to, energy intensive to grow that tail back, um, but there are a lot of medical implications of this. If we can understand from a stem cell perspective how they're able to have cells that could then regenerate a tail, that could have implications for you know, being able to help uh, human medicine as well. And another salamander that's in this uh, type of, of field that's been heavily studied by the medical uh, uh, profession is as the oxalotl and that's a salamander that lives in Mexico and it has an incredible ability to regenerate even to the point where it can lose limbs and grow them back uh, so there's a lot of implications there this salamander is also lungless so all of its gas interchange comes from through the skin uh, so there are no lungs in this salamander, which is pretty phenomenal, and yet it can live terrestrially. It's not bound to the water. Uh, it is limited to sphagnum moss. So uh, one of my big projects that I work on is the Northern Peatland Project, where I uh, talk about the importance of that ecosystem, and that ecosystem has an incredible amount of sphagnum moss. So the four-toed salamander is one of those salamanders that uh, is very important to that ecosystem and that you can find there. And in addition, another salamander that's very similar to the four toed is the two line salamander. And I have not found one of them yet, so I have not, I'll, I won't share information or pictures on that, but hopefully this season I'll be able to encounter one uh, because that's the namesake of, of my company, Two Line Studio. Next, we have the Eastern Newt, and this is one that uh, is pretty incredible because they're just so pervasive. Wherever you find them, there are so many of them. They can live for 12 to 15 years. They lay between 200 to 400 eggs, and they have an aquatic stage, a juvenile stage where they are terrestrial, and then they have another adult stage where they return to the water. And the interesting thing about this is that it's driven by environmental factors. 
So they will only switch back into an aquatic stage if the conditions lend themselves towards that. So they can spend their entire life as juveniles in a terrestrial environment, or they can just stay aquatic if the conditions are perfect. Um, and But eventually they come back to being aquatic adults where they will be able to mate and breed and bring the next generation forward. These are also slightly toxic and they have these orange dots on their body to be able to indicate that. And they have um, pheromones, once again, that allow them to communicate with one another. And the orange dots are also a way to attract mates based on how vibrant those spots are. That's actually an indication of their health and it helps females be able to decide if they want to mate with a male. And they also do the tail dance that many of the salamanders do. This fact always blows my mind. If you were to gather all of the moose and deer in Maine together and measure their biomass, uh, you would be able to show that moose and deer have less biomass than all of the eastern newts in Maine. So that just gives you an, an idea of how many eastern newts are living in that ecosystem. That literally, if you gathered all of them together, it's more biomass than the whole population of moose and deer in Maine. Absolutely mind blowing. Here's a, let's see if this will play. So this is a video showing an eastern newt uh, moving through. So again, this is that uh, juvenile terrestrial stage. So they look very different. They're bright orange. They have those bright orange dots and they'll spend time, you know, hunting invertebrates and, and insects uh, before they return to their aquatic stage as adults. So that kind of brings me through the different species that I wanted to introduce you to. That just brushes the surface of all the different species that you might encounter on a big night migration. And depending on what region you're in, you might have the chance to be able to see other species or uh, different species might be more common in your area. Uh, but today I wanted to be able to save time to be able to talk about photographing the big night. Um, and three topics that I want to cover related to that are the ethics of photographing amphibians and what techniques um, are more ethical or better to use. Then we'll talk about the gear uh, that can be helpful both from a photography standpoint and for just being safe on these big night migrations, which, which often bring you to roadsides. And then some techniques that I've used or learned about uh, to be able to get great pictures. So from an ethical perspective, this is a field of photography in terms of ethics as it relates to wildlife photography that's fairly new. Like we're starting to have more scientific studies that are investigating the impacts of taking pictures of wildlife, in particular flash and how flash relates to uh, whether it's negatively impacting that individual. Uh, and for me, when I'm photographing these species, my number one goal is to help them cross the road. That is it. Number two, as long as it doesn't interfere with that, is that I would love to capture photos of these creatures to hopefully help conservation efforts and to help education efforts. So for me, I'm always trying to hold these two goals in mind. And sometimes the photographer in me takes over and I get really obsessed. But if I start seeing that I'm affecting the animal's behavior in a negative way, we'll talk about that. Uh, that's when you know to stop and move on and make sure that this uh, animal is safe. Um, the other ethics relate to understanding the species. So we want to avoid handling them whenever possible, which is why I put a picture of holding a salamander on here. <laughs> um, and part of that is because our hands can contain chemicals that would be bad for the salamander, because again, they breathe through their skin, very permeable surface. Uh, so you have to have proper hand washing techniques um, and, and rinsing and drying techniques before you handle a salamander. And the other side of that too is that uh, these animals have diseases that they can spread to one another. In particular, there's a chytrid fungus that is spread among amphibians that's causing huge population plummets around the world. 
Uh, so we want to make sure that if, if one salamander is infected, we don't want to spread that to another. And so it's really important to wash with soap and water in between touching two individuals. And you want to make sure that there's no residue of soap afterwards. So just something to be really aware of. Um, the other thing you want to do is limit the use of flash, uh, that burst of light that can disorient the animals and use a diffuser. So I, there is not currently a scientific peer-reviewed article, to my knowledge, that looks at whether or not amphibians get disoriented by flash. But for me, as a wildlife enthusiast and someone who's working in conservation, to me, it's important to limit the use of flash um, and maybe even not use it until we can determine for sure that it's not going to impact them. Because the worst case scenario is that you use flash and then these animals are disoriented and they can't figure out how to make it to their breeding grounds. Um, so the, one of the ways I get around that is that these volunteer efforts, all these scientists and people who are working on this issue, they have headlamps and they're using those headlamps to help the salamanders cross the road. Part of that is for safety of the people who are doing this so that they're visible to vehicles and also so they can see what they're doing. And these animals don't seem to be affected by headlamps. They'll just keep cruising across the road, whether they're in the beam of the headlamp or if they're in the complete darkness. So for me, that gives me pretty good peace of mind that I can use a headlamp to properly light the scene and then take a picture without flash. Um, and then just observing the animal's behavior. You know, these animals will respond to what you're doing. If, if they feel threatened, they're going to hunker down and they'll lower themselves so that their whole body is pushed against the ground. Um, and if they're feeling comfortable, they'll, the most comfortable is that they'll continue on their path. They'll keep moving at the pace that they were moving before you encountered them. And that's the best case scenario. If they stop and their head is still up and they're alert, um, you can keep working. But really for each individual that I'm photographing, I'm trying to spend as little time as possible. I'm trying to have all my settings set in advance. And then I'm trying to work incredibly quickly so that I can have as little of an impact as possible on these animals. So now a chat about the gear. And, and just to wrap up that conversation about ethics, this is a huge place for discussion. I think I'm on the conservative side of how careful I am about this. I've seen a lot of other photographers who don't hesitate around using flash. And like I said, there's a lot of discussion boards and people don't seem to think that it's really impacting their behavior too much. And maybe there isn't that much of a difference between flash and headlamps. So this is all just kind of food for thought. I think the important thing is paying attention to the behavior of the animal. If you're changing the behavior, if you're negatively impacting it, you should probably stop uh, what you're doing. So let's talk about gear. Uh, the non-camera gear that's essential. You've got to have uh, rain gear, it's important to have rain pants too. Often I'll just wear my uh, fishing waders um, and then a rain jacket on top. Uh, a dry bag to be able to keep anything you need to keep dry because these nets, these nights, especially the big, big nights are soaking wet. Everything is wet. And that is essentially creating the proper environment for these animals to be able to move through. Because again, they breathe through their skin and part of what they need is a moist environment to be able to properly allow that gas exchange. If they dry out, then they don't, they have a lot of problems. Um, the other thing that's important to have is a reflective vest because often uh, when you're going out on a big night, you're going to places where you know that these animals are crossing the road uh, because there have been year to year observations of that happening. Um, it's really important that if you know where the road is and where they often cross, it could be a two mile section of road, uh, that you don't drive it, uh, because it's, it's pretty hard to be able to see them. Obviously a spotted salamander, seven inches long, you have a pretty good chance of being able to see them from the car with the headlights, but it's best if you can park and then walk that road. 
and you just walk back and forth on the section that you know is going to have the greatest uh, number of salamanders. And on a really big night, you're with salamanders the whole time. Uh, so a reflective vest helps to indicate to cars that might be moving on that road uh, to stop and slow down. Uh, headlamp is really important both uh, you know, for cars to be able to see you as well as to be able to see the salamanders. And what you're looking for is basically a glisten. Like you're using that headlamp to point down the road as you're walking and you'll just see a small reflection of light uh, the size of a salamander. And that's your indication that there's a salamander up ahead. So you're always looking for that shine. Um, another one that I bring along is a, a water bottle filled with soap, soapy water that I can just use to wash my hands in between every time I'm handling, if I am handling a salamander, I try to avoid doing that. Usually I'm just walking with the salamander, making sure that they cross the road safely without my assistance. Um, and then another water bottle to rinse your hand and a clean, dry towel to be able to dry off. And that's the, you know, the safest way to ensure that you don't have anything on your hands that could be harmful to any of these critters. Um, if you're on a road that's really busy, the best thing for that animal is to pick it up and move it across the road. But if you're on a road that's a slow speed limit, you have really good protective gear and reflective gear, um, and there's not very many people coming, then it's best to just walk alongside them and help them cross the road. And for photography, it's best not to stop them in the middle of the road. You know, you want to let them walk the whole length, maybe even get off into the safer habitat and get pictures that way. So gear as it relates to the camera, like I said, my lighting setup is with a headlamp. Uh, so I'm, I'm using that in my hand and my camera and, the, you know, positioning the light where I want it and then holding the camera uh, to be able to get the shot. Um, and then potentially, depending on where you fall on the conversation about ethics, a flash as well as a diffuser to be able to make it so that that flash isn't quite so harsh. Um, a tripod is helpful to be able to stabilize. And the reality is that you're trying to get down as low as possible. So you're trying to put that tripod down against the ground at the same level as the animal. Um, and a tripod can help do that if the legs come all the way out. Uh, macro lens is the best possible lens to use, but you can also do a lot of great work with a telephoto lens. Um, and a wide angle lens helps to tell the bigger story, as long as that wide angle lens has a really close focusing distance uh, to be able to get up and close and personal with these animals. And then uh, a towel and an umbrella. These are really important. So uh, the other thing I would mention is that for gear, it's best to stick to a fixed lens, which means that there's no extension of the lens. And that's because you're shooting in the rain, everything's wet. And if you have any kind of a, um, a, a telephoto lens that's extending, there's ways for the water to get pulled into the lens as you zoom in and out. Uh, so if you do have that situation, having an umbrella to keep the camera dry, maybe have someone helping you and hold the umbrella over you um, can help, um, but then, uh, if you do have a lens that zooms that way, um, pick a length and stick to it and then don't open it up or close it down uh, because when you move it, that's the opportunity when the water can enter into the lens itself and ruin your lens. Um, so the gear that I'm using, um, all these pictures were actually taken on a Z6, uh, but this year I'll be on the Z8. Um, and uh, the 20 millimeter lens is my favorite uh, wide angle uh, lens from Nikon. And then the 105 millimeter macro is new to me this year as well. Uh, so I'm excited to use that. All of these pictures were actually taken with a 70 to 200 millimeter with the Z6. Uh, so everything that I've just mentioned in terms of my gear now um, is going to be a big upgrade in this next big night season. So I'm super excited to see what happens, but it also shows you, you don't have to have the best gear to be able to get some really cool photos. Um, my dream down the line, if you ever follow like amphibian specific accounts, everybody has a probe lens and Venus Lawa is the one that's making 
it's like this really long tube um, with lights built into the end that are steady lights, they're not flash. And the tube itself is actually something you can stick under the water to be, be able to get underwater photography uh, shots. And it's a super wide angle lens that allows you to have both the subject really large because you're so close to it, but then also incorporate some of the background because so much of the story here that you're trying to tell is habitat. You're trying to show the habitats that these animals are moving through. And I think the pictures that I've taken have been good for telling the, uh, just kind of identifying these individuals and trying to bring them to life. Uh, but I would say I'm excited to get out with the wider angle lens this year to be able to tell more of a ecosystem story. So techniques. The big thing to do is practice. If you go out and it is a big night and it's the first time that you've tried to shoot in the dark, with a headlamp as your light source, you're bound for, for failure. Uh, so you wanna try and develop your settings before you go out. And it sounds silly, but get a stick um, in your driveway, right? And soak that stick in water and get out there with a headlamp and take pictures of it and figure out with your camera system what settings you need to be able to take a picture. And I say soak it with water because that'll give it some of the reflected reflectiveness that a salamander would have. Maybe you even get like a little toy lizard or something and just practice getting the focus and, and plan your shot. Um, it can be surprising how low you need to get against the ground to be able to get the angle that you want. Um, and start planning your shot. Think about what are you trying to communicate? Are you trying to uh, show the personality of this animal? Are you trying to capture them in their ecosystem? And that can help you decide what lenses you want to use um, and what techniques you want to try. And I can't emphasize this enough. You're trying to, in most wildlife photography scenarios, and right now it's kind of funny because this is an exception, you want to get down on the level of the animal. So you're looking eye to eye with it. And in this case, these salamanders are one inch off the ground. So really, in most cases, your camera is as low as possible, maybe even resting on the ground. Um, and then it can be really helpful to have um, uh, your viewfinder, your viewing screen, if it can pop out and, and adjust um, that way. You can angle it so that you can be looking down at your screen while the camera is pointing straight forward on the ground. Um, another one that's helpful is to use manual focus and you're trying to get the eyes as sharp as possible. Um, and that'll help make sure that you've got a great photo. Um, and play around with different angles. Like this one was a top-down angle you're seeing the splash of water and it's helping to show that story that I was talking about earlier where every salamander, every spotted salamander has a unique set of spots on its back that actually identify that ind individual. Uh, so play around with, you know, top down shots right from the side, straight on, you know, play with different angles to figure out which one uh, tells the story that you're looking for. And the final one is to work as quickly as possible. So get those settings right. Uh, you're also trying to limit how long your camera is exposed to the environment because it's so wet. Uh, so bring a dry bag that once you're done working with an individual, spend you know 30 seconds to a minute with one individual and make sure they're on their merry way and then get your camera in a dry environment. Um, with that said, there sometimes when you're you don't want to get it to necessarily a dry environment because sometimes that can trap the moisture as well so it you're you're just at least keep it on a, under an umbrella or something like that um, a couple other things to mention with techniques is that it's incredibly low light conditions so you want to use as wide of an f-stop and aperture as possible to let as much light come into the scenario um, and then you want to watch out for noise. So you're going to push the ISO up as high as it needs to be to be able to have a shutter speed that's one over the length of your lens times two. So that's like the general rule, rule of thumb all the time. 
these animals are not moving really quickly so you don't have to go much faster than that but the rule of thumb is if you're using something like a 50 millimeter you should shoot at one over a hundred shutter speed so a lot of times what i'll do is i'll go into aperture priority and i'll select a really shallow depth of field so on some of these lenses you're going down to f 2.8 or 3.2 and then i will set the shutter speed um, or, or so i'll see what the shutter speed is in aperture priority because you're choosing the aperture it's automatically shutting setting the shutter speed based on your iso and then finally i'll push the iso up until i get a shutter speed that i'm happy with now if your camera is resting on the ground you can get away with a slower shutter speed because these animals are not moving very quickly um, sometimes they can be surprising uh, but generally that's what i'm looking at um, and you can go in manual mode and every once in a while i'll actually underexpose these images um, and then in post editing i'll bring the exposure up and that can also help with um, reducing the noise from high iso or give you the shutter speed that you're looking for so just like anything the biggest thing is to play around try a bunch of different things see what works best for your camera for you for your lighting setup um, and then go from there so on this one i really love in this image that you see how for this animal you're right on its level you're looking eye to eye with it the eye is in focus um, i'm a little bit disappointed that the light is hitting its tail and its body so much but it also draws your eye to its feet and that's the thing that this photo says the most for me is that those feet are actually submerged in water this animal's moving across the road but it's so wet out that it's moving within this watery environment and that's what the big night is all about being able to give the conditions for these animals to make for them this epic journey to this habitat that they need to get to but they can only access it when it's in these perfect environmental conditions. The other thing I love about this is that he's got like pine needles stuck to his body. It's clear that he just emerged out of the woods. I remember this night, it was barely 40 degrees. There were still some snow banks on the sides of the road that they were crawling across. Um, and then the other thing that's, that uh, is, you know, just from a body type, these salamanders have really ribbed bellies, and I love how this photo really captures that. That's like a very unique thing. And the way that they move, they kind of undulate their bodies back and forth. And so to me, those are all the things that this picture captures. This one, I really love. Again, you're playing with the angle. The lighting is really nice. It's coming from the left-hand side. I'm holding the headlamp here while I take a picture here. And the tilt of the head. Uh, just kind of makes it look like that salamander is smiling. Uh, with the way that the light is coming from the left to the right, just the angle that it hit its head, you're actually getting this kind of blue reflection inside the eyes, which is looking at its sclera, this like coating on its retina. Um, and to me, that was like kind of just this cool uh, look of this photo. And then I love on both of these pictures, I love how the, the, the road is so saturated. There's so much of a coating of water. You can actually see reflections of the spots, the yellow spots in the, in the road itself. Um, so that was really fun to be able to capture. This one is taking a step back. And again, all of these are shot at like between 70 and 200 millimeters. Most of them were shot at with a 200 millimeter lens because I was trying to give as much length as possible. But this one, I got a little bit further away from that animal um, and I wanted to get its whole body and then kind of show the depth of the area. And I love that you can see the shadow that's cast. Its whole side of its body is lit up. I wish the light wasn't so hot on its tail, um, but I, you know, I was pretty proud of, of the composition of this one. This is a photo of being playful with technique. So another thing that I brought in the field with me, I properly cleaned and prepared a mirror. And then I brought that mirror into the field and laid it on the, in, in the pathway of the animal 
allowed the animal to move across that mirror and then took a picture as it was coming across. And so part of the reason why I did that is that this individual, this uh, uh, four-toed salamander is unique in that it has this white belly with black spots. And um, they're also unique in that if you remember, if you grab them, you have the chance that they're gonna detach their tail. And I guess I remember, now I'm remembering that I missed this fact. There are some scientists that believe that they can actually detach their tail if they're alarmed. Um, and I'm, I just haven't seen the evidence for this, but some very reputable organizations have listed that on their websites as, as being something that's been observed. So they're really, really, um, you know, you don't want to upset the salamander on the chance that you're going to cause it to detach its tail uh, because that's a huge resource intensive thing for them to grow that back. So I set the mirror down, allowed it to move across so that I didn't have to place it on the mirror and then got this photo. And I was really happy with it because it did what I was looking for, but I didn't have a macro lens. So this year I want to try this technique again and get it with the macro lens because then it'll make the uh, image even crisper and, and the salamander look larger. Because you remember this thing's only two inches long. And this one I was again shooting from up above. So the big night is so much fun because you have all these different species that are available to you, just a few of them shown here. Uh, but the other thing I'd encourage you to do is get to know your amphibians throughout the year. Uh, it can be really fun to shoot them in their own habitat, right? So here's an American toad. They're one of the later ones to emerge, but you'll hear their chorus. They have really a, a trill. It's like a that's their, more like their call. Uh, tree frogs kind of sound like that too, so you kind of have to know which which quality you're listening for. Um, but you're all these guys are hopping through the woods. They're mostly nocturnal, but you can find them through the day, throughout the day. Uh, this is a red-backed newt, very uh, very small salamander, and wood frog. Uh, so I just encourage you to just pay attention to the forest floor as you're moving through it. Roll logs over. Um, but be sure to put that log back. If you if you roll a log and find a salamander, make sure you move the salamander away before you roll the log back, and then the salamander will get back under there. You don't want to squish the salamander underneath the log. Uh, so these are just different habitats that you can find these animals and pay attention. And it can be a really incredible opportunity to allow other people to explore this. And again, if you are handling these creatures, uh, you want to make sure that you're washing your hands with soap and water. This is my niece, uh, Molly, with a blue spotted salamander as well. Uh, so it's a really incredible opportunity to kind of open people's eyes to the wonder of the natural world. So if you're excited about salamanders, if I haven't lost you yet, uh, a couple of ideas here uh, for how you can help. Unfortunately, amphibians are in rough, uh, rough shape more than half of them could go extinct in our lifetime. That's due to habitat destruction, invasive species, pollution, global warming, diseases, and road mortality. So the big night is an opportunity to be able to help support them. So if you have a spring day that's warm, wet, and the ground is thawed, consider not driving in those first couple hours after sunset. Uh, and also you could consider uh, voting for seasonal road closures. There are particular places that we know these animals are crossing and we can, it can be very effective to close the road from now until a month from now, just to capture the big night somewhere in there, uh, if possible. Uh, volunteering on the big night can be really great to be able to help these animals move across the road. And there are a lot of groups that provide training to be able to help you get ready to go out and do that. A lot of the state environmental agencies, if you look on their websites and search for amphibian crossings that are big night migrations, they'll be able to help out. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a lot of information about this. And then local conservation groups. You can have a pool on your property, a vernal pool on your property, uh, certified through a different uh, a process that varies by state. But this helps them track where these uh, migrations might be happening. Um, and then if you are having to have any forestry operations on your property, you can um, make sure that you're working with a, a certified forester who 
uh, is allowing for that buffer zone because if you have any pollutants in an ecosystem, having uh, mature forest around that vernal pool ensures that any of those pollutants are filtered out before they reach the water. And then you can also support conservation groups who are working on this issue. Uh, here are just a couple examples of, of places where there are seasonal road closures from New Hampshire to Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, a lot of different areas do this, and there are also ways to build underpasses. And if you go to last week's webinar, you can learn a bit more about this, about these uh, modifications to roadways in really high traffic areas to be able to help salamanders uh, cross the road. And if you're excited about this storytelling, you can follow along um, on the Northern Peatlands Project. You can go to twoline.com slash tracks or scan this QR code to bring you to a lot of stories from the field. And these are stories that I'm working on, photographs that I'm taking to be able to help promote awareness of uh, peatlands, which are an essential ecosystem to support biodiversity and our global amphibian populations. So uh, you can definitely follow along there and feel free to get in touch. I know I didn't leave. <laughs> I left two minutes for questions, so I'm sorry for talking so much, but Thank you for tuning in to something that's so important to me. Um, and I hope that I helped inspire you to help out our amphibians this spring. Charlie, thank you so much. Um, it truly is fascinating and you bring so much um, attention to the details and really help you suck us in and help us understand how special these creatures are. Um, we do have some questions to jump through real quickly. Um, the difference between a newt and a salamander. Yeah, so there are, it's it's a complicated question. Um, there's kind of uh, genetics is the, the quick answer, right? There are different family trees of salamanders and there are the true salamanders and then there are newts and then there's kind of different groups in between. Um, again, we're, right now I'm using common species names, so common names, um, and they can be a little bit um, non-specific. And so if we were using species names, we'd know the genus and species, and it would be very specific. And we could kind of start to go into the different uh, phylogenies or, or how different species are related to be able to show you the difference. But in some groups of scientists, it's very specific when you're talking about newts versus salamanders, but really you have to get down to the species name to know the differences. It's basically how related they are to each other. And there are some vague differences, but in general, they're this, basically the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we have some, some folks out there who are very um, clearly concerned about these sweet little creatures and want to know um, more about how the mirrors or lights, um, I guess they want to just you to confirm that mirrors and lights are not affecting them in a negative way. Yeah, and there's not a lot of research out there. And again, for me personally, if I'm taking pictures of these animals, I'm spending as little time as possible with them. I'm trying to subject them to as little torment as possible. So reducing the amount of light, um, and then I'm paying attention to if there are any scientific papers that come out that say, hey, we shouldn't be using light at all or flash at all. Um, and I haven't seen that yet. Uh, the other side of it, too, is that we need to increase the awareness of this event to a broader number of people. And what's the best way to do that? By sharing compelling images and videos of these species. And if people are taking pictures with their phones or with their cameras, and trying to spread the word of that this is something that's happening and hey, let's close roads. That benefit to me is worth working towards and worth trying to capture these images uh, to be able to do that. But with that said, it's really important to read up. You know, my presentation today isn't enough necessarily for someone to go out and be safe with these critters tomorrow. I'd encourage you to go to you know state agencies and U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife to be able to go through their training. They have webinars online that you can watch to be able to learn how to safely handle amphibians and how to help help them on the big night migration. 
Mm. Um, and can you clarify, is it a is it one night or does this happen over a couple or several nights? Yeah, so if you take a look at the presentation from last week, that'll help give a longer explanation. But uh, the general uh, thing is that this is multiple nights. When these conditions are right, the animals are on the move. And as you can imagine, it's kind of a microclimate thing. So half a mile away, the conditions might not be per perfectly right. Um, and so you'll get this happening sporadically throughout the region. So for this next, you know, for, for spring, when the conditions are right, there's a chance that a big night will be happening. But because of climate change, we're not having this really clear separation from winter to spring. And there's more sporadic movements, which means that there aren't as big of nights anymore. We're recording that it's, it's more sporadic movements. It's not all at once. Um, so yeah, it's, it's always been spread out over many nights, but there are certain nights that are particularly big because they're the first warm, wet, uh, you know, night uh, where the amphibians move. Got it. Well, that is the last question we have time for today. So I'll turn it back to you for closing comments. Well, thank you for tuning in. Feel free to get in touch if you have more questions and uh, definitely check out some of those resources that I pointed you towards if you're interested in joining a brigade and getting out there to see it happen and to help it help it along. So thanks for your help and thanks for tuning in. I want to be part of a salamander brigade. That sounds like a, a good, good thing to be part of. Thank you again for taking time to present to us today. And I want to thank everybody who tuned in and who submitted such thoughtful questions. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everyone.